Circle of Birth podcasts, reclaiming our birth potential with ancient wisdom and stories from birth and beyond, sharing the rich spectrum of family diversity and transformation, stories worldwide bringing together community and connectivity. Come together with story medicine and inspire at our unique birth journeys. We breathe, we birth, we become. So that beautiful voice you heard is our guest on this podcast, Tallulah. And we have four birth stories that will truly take you on the road of transformation. Finding out how important we are in this process of birth and journeying is crucial. And Tallulah shows us in each of her journeys that no matter what, support, care and love to the birthing mother is vital for us to grow. So this podcast dives deeply into the cosmic women's mysteries, each with its own lesson that you'll be sure to see the gifts that it can bring. Enjoy. Hi, Tallulah. Welcome to the Circle of Birth. I'm going to introduce you as my teacher of the women's mysteries in the eight seasons journey that I'm currently doing. Um, You're a mama of four and we were just talking before, you're a mixed bag of lollies, (laughs) um, which will all come out. We'll go through that bag of lollies and (laughs) see what all the beautiful things you have to offer. So welcome so much to the show. Thank you, Ali, so much for inviting me. So I feel that you're you're a mum of four and Mm -hmm. I feel that your four birth journeys are going to lead us on a really great story um, of women's mysteries, family, uh, making sacred, Mm -hmm. which is your other work and all the wonderful things that we can talk about. So how about... We go back to your first pregnancy and can you offer an insight into the Tallulah? Yes, thank you. Your first child. Okay, so uh, I come from a long line of women. In fact, at least five generations of women who uh, got pregnant before they got married. And it was up until my pregnancy, kind of a shame, you know, a shame, a secret thing, Um, married, pregnant, in a blue wedding dress, in a Protestant church for a Catholic girl, those kinds of stories. So that was um, my mum was pregnant with me uh, when she was 17 and had a traditional shotgun wedding at nine months pregnant. And so I had that story in my mind and everyone was just like oh thank god she's out of her teens she's not going to live that again but we're in a new generation a new time and I was 26 and um which is quite was quite young is quite young to have a baby these days uh, or get pregnant um but I was with my boyfriend and we were you know really got serious and He asked me to marry him one night and the very next day I found out I was pregnant with our first baby. So it was a little rewriting of the story and it was um, a celebration of many things, but for me it felt like a, a celebration of changing that story of shame and I was quite proud and happy to get married as a pregnant woman, five months pregnant. So the pregnancy was, you know, newlyweds and figuring out how to be married and getting excited about having our little baby. And I had had really heard no horror stories of birth my whole life, um, except what I'd seen on television. My mum grew up on a farm, so she, you know, birth was just a really normal, easy uh, part of life thing that you did and I had no fears going into my first birth. How was your birth? My birth was, so mum was um, 17 and in a tiny town in New South Wales in a country hospital and I was two weeks preemie so she, uh, her mum had left town who was going to be with her when she gave birth but they thought oh she'll go over, she won't have the baby early and had me early and so she was by herself the whole time and because she was young and they thought it would take ages they put her in a room all day 
all night by herself and then uh, with trialing gas. And then um, I came at around one in the morning and it was all pretty easy and normal, no drama, but it was the 70s, so I was taken to the nursery. She didn't hold me or anything until the next day. Um, so we all presume I was given a bottle there. I wasn't breastfed with my mom. She says she did a few times, but her biggest fear was getting pregnant again straight away. So she went straight back on the pill. And so her milk dried up straight away. So my imprint of birth was really normal, easy, uh, but removal from the mother early on. So um, I was aware of that. And I... Well, of course, wanted a home birth, but couldn't afford it, being newlyweds. And so we booked into the birth center at Randwick. And um, there was this little story going along the way all throughout. Oh, sometimes the birth center is closed, but don't worry. It hardly ever happens. It won't happen to you. And um, I uh, did my birthing education with Marie Burrows at Birth Rights, which was, which was awesome and supported my beliefs about um, birth being normal part of life uh, but I really still did not have any idea what it was to walk into the hospital and what a system I would be walking into and how I would um, just become a part of that system once I entered there so so did your group of friends or family um, was there any experience of birth around you that sort of directed you guys knowing that you wanted to have a home birth or a birth center or uh well I was kind of the first of my friends to have a baby so I had one other friend and she was full private hospital girl so and I didn't I knew that that wasn't for me and we couldn't afford it yes and um so I did interview with a home birth midwife, but the reality was we couldn't afford it. But I had, I used to work at, um, there was a whole food shop in Sydney and I used to work there with this woman who was uh, probably 20 years older than me, but had um, home births uh, with a car. So I had heard her stories. And when I found out I was pregnant, I just organized to meet up with her and talk with her and learn everything I could. She told me about Sheila Kitzinger. She told me about um, gentle birth, gentle mothering, Sarah Buckley. So she just gave me all uh, the other book I read was Spiritual Midwifery. That became my Bible. So I just was really fortunate that that person was someone that I had had the most experience talking about having babies and giving birth. And so I was really kind of luckily led down that path. Um, so my expectation was natural birth. And um, I was 41 plus, 40 plus 10 days. So, yeah, 41 plus three days pregnant and went in and had to go to see the obstetrician because I was overdue, according to them. And he said, oh, we'll give you one more night to go into labor. And they did a sweep which I didn't really know what that was at the time, um, a stretch and sweep. And he said, I'll give you one more night and then you'll be back in for an induction tomorrow. And I said, no, I won't. And I left and I went into labour that night at home. And um, I, I called my mum and she flew down to be with me. That was something I was really clear about, wanting my mum to be there. Um, and I had two friends who I had asked to be my doulas, but they weren't actually actually doulas. So they'd never attended a birth in hospital before, or maybe not even attended a birth before, but they were just close girlfriends. And I did a lot. I did all of the labor at home, basically. And I was very silent and on my side. The whole time I could only lie on my right side. I didn't want to move. And... Um, Everyone was kind of thinking I was a long way off. My husband was asleep next to me clutching the birth notes from our birthing class. Uh-huh, <laughs> and I said, look, I think this is, you know, this is happening now. And he looked at the notes and he said, no, I think this is early days. And he went back to sleep. 
And I said to my friend, this is serious. I need to go to hospital now. And she said, oh, from what I can tell, you're in very early labor. And I was like, if this is early labor, I can't handle it anymore. Take me to hospital. And my mom said, let's just take her. She wants to go. So we piled in the car and went there. And the birth center was closed. Um, the one night of the year that it was closed or whatever. It was not staffed. They didn't, oh, someone was sick. Yeah. So I went to, had to go to the labor ward. Um, and they did an internal and I was nine and a half centimeters with a, a big anterior lip. So, um, I, they told me, and I was really wanting to push and she said, don't push, you can't push. So I was, if you, I know most of your listeners will give them birth, but when you have the urge to push, to not push is the most excruciating thing. And they left me for about two hours to not push. And I was just grinding my teeth and crying through all of that. Two hours told not to push yeah yeah and how, how was that that was pretty it was not big. good yeah. yeah yeah it was really big and it's just a flash in my memory right now but at the time it felt like eternity um and then she came back in and checked me again she said look there's still a bit of a lip and I just burst into tears and and said please can I push and she said okay just give it a go and then I pushed him out within about um, uh, 15 minutes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but it was all, you know, on my back and, um, people were holding my legs up. Mum was holding my head up, push, push, all of that language. And, um, and then he came out and came up to my chest and, uh, it was a boy, Taj, and he, Uh, He was a bit tacky and which is breathing and heart rate a bit fast. I think I get those mixed up and tachycardia, the midwives will know. And so they took him to the NICU. So we had the replay of the separation. But I, when they said they were going to take him, I just yelled at my husband go with him and don't take your hand off him. Don't let them do anything to him without you say, I was just shouting orders down the hallway. And, um, he was in the Miku for four days and which was really unnecessary. He would, they took a swab for infection on the first day and they said he needed to stay in Miku until the swab was back, which I, you know, later learned that, I could have said, no, I want him with me, but I was a very good girl and behaving myself and doing what I was told to do. So he stayed down there. I was, I remember being up in my room crying because I could hear all the other babies crying with their mommies and being with their moms. And so I would just be down and then it could all night long with him. And, um, that was pretty traumatic, that separation. And he was actually fine after, um, you know, a few days. He had no machines connected to him or anything. He was breathing perfectly fine on his own. So that was my little Taj. He was breastfed and all that was, you know, challenging for the first time. But um, he was a darling little boy. So when he came out, did mm-hmm. you, how was that feeling for you? Did you get a moment to sort of gauge that feeling of made into motherhood? I did have a moment. And when I look back at the photos now, I can see the change in me. Like just um, before you go into labor, you have absolutely, for the first time, you have absolutely no idea what it could possibly be, this initiation that you're about to have. And so seeing pictures of me before I gave birth and seeing pictures of me after I gave birth, it's just a, uh, a knowing and, uh, and an appreciation for women across all time who have done this thing. So I remember in my labor clearly thinking of all the thousands of women, which I hear many women say, all the thousands of women giving birth at the exact same time as me, of my mother, of my grandmothers, of 
uh, all the women who had done it before. And it was just like, oh, this is what they're talking about. I was thinking during the labor, why didn't anyone ever tell me it was like this? But no one could have ever told me what it was going to be like. So I was definitely a different person from that moment. Harold's Taj now? He just turned 14 last right. week. Yeah, okay. And in the NICU, did you get to hold him? Um, we weren't allowed, I wasn't allowed to hold him, I think, for the first 24 hours, and he was nil by mouth, and um, he had a dextrose drip. So his first meal was sugar, sugar water, and uh, I was. You asking these questions is reminding me of all the little details of the trauma of Niku um, trying to express into a syringe colostrum when you've never breastfed before is like a really tricky thing, really hard. So I spent hours and hours and hours trying to express colostrum so he could get that and getting, you know, a tiny little syringe full and keeping it in the fridge down there and checking that they were giving it to him. So, yeah, I could hold him after the first day and then started the whole trying to breastfeed and um, get that established, which was tricky at the start. It's amazing the perseverance of mother that comes through, isn't it? Oh, so determined, Mm. so determined. Do you feel from this birth, what's your lesson? What did you learn? I learned I was incredibly strong and that I didn't need any help and that I could do it all on my own. And there's things about the birth that I think um, because we were in the labour ward and not in the birth centre, they cut his cord immediately. And I think that had a lot to do with his breathing issues. So I feel that, you know, if I had been left alone, it would have been a much smoother ride. So he taught me that I could that I could do anything Mm. on my own. So this birth set a big patch, a big change in your path. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's walk through that. Okay. So after I had him, I said, everybody needs a trained birth assistant with them when they go into a hospital. It became so clear to me in that time that I would have been very well assisted by a trained birth attendant. So I went and did my doula training. At, uh, I began with Denise Love and then it changed hands to Renee Adair. So I did that over one year. I did my doula training and then I went on to do my CBE training as well and became a doula and uh, <clears throat> in that time got pregnant with my second child and uh, decided to have a home birth with him no matter what. (laughs) So we worked it out how to have a home birth and move towards that. And what actually happened in my doula training was that I learned a lot and I got a lot of fear. I became very fearful because I learned about stillbirth and that there was actually nothing that could tell me that that wasn't going to happen to me and that I'm just as likely as anybody to have that experience and so I actually held on to quite a lot of fear in that pregnancy that he would die which I didn't tell anybody not my midwife not my husband until I was uh, 41 weeks pregnant and it was a Pit in the pit of my stomach fear that I had. And I remember not letting myself love him in case, just in case he wasn't going to stay. And then I was hanging the washing out one day and I just burst into tears and said, I have to tell somebody that I feel like this because it's not, not right. And once I relieved myself of that fear and told my husband and I told one of my close friends and they both said, He's, he's going to be okay, he's, he's going to stay, don't worry. And it just, that fear left my body. So the power of carrying a fear is really big. And I was uh, holding him in. So all my babies came at 42 weeks um, of the 
of all four of them. So, But we were still expecting that maybe this second baby would come a bit earlier. So the longer it went on, the bigger that fear got in my head. So I kind of exploded with it at the end. And then, and then I went into labor. So again, I had two doulas and my mum came down and I had a midwife in the days where you could have one midwife for your home birth. And um, my husband and the birth was, so my first birth was about eight hours in total. And this one came on super intense and was really different labor. The first one I just laid on my side, this one I had to move. I couldn't stop moving. And I was on hands and knees and rocking and rolling and moving all around and got into the birth pool and he was born in four hours. Um, I birthed him into my hands and brought him up out of the water and this little guy named Eden, Eden Phoenix, he didn't ever really breathe well. So... Uh, we, he was born at 4.20 in the morning and by 8 o'clock in the morning he was, so he didn't really feed, he didn't really, he was doing, uh, he was grunting and <clears throat> um, just struggling the whole time and the midwife had gone, she didn't think it was anything and at 8 o'clock in the morning on a, I think it was a Tuesday, so a weekday, he went blue. And we had to, the midwife came back and we went to the hospital and it was peak hour traffic. In retrospect, we should have called an ambulance, but we instead drove in peak hour traffic, me holding my blue baby in the back of the car. Very, very upsetting. And then he, uh, got there to the Prince of Wales and yeah, Niku, very serious. They never really knew what was wrong with him. He his lungs presented like he was a preemie. They were full of uh, the X-ray was kind of the lungs were very white, full of something, but it wasn't meconium. Um, they they didn't ever know what it was. There was never a reason why this happened there was a bit because he was born in the water there was lots of questions about that and um it was full damage control with us being a, a home birth transfer going into the hospital the midwife was having to do a lot of talking and he was um in a <clears throat> humidity crib but also with the little box over his head and he had the CPAP and um a drip and all sorts of things going in and out of his body. I couldn't really, I couldn't see his face. And he was really upset. So he was given antibiotics as well, swabs taken, given dextrose drip. I was uh, like completely trashed, sitting, I'd just given birth and I had horrendous after pains and I was getting some you know, not optimal care from the hospital staff because I was a home birther. And uh, I, my mum came with me and she, she sat with him while I went and had a sleep. And um, my doulas were there. That's what I needed, those two doulas. I needed all of that help. The other doula took my two-year-old for a fun day. And so I, I've always had lots of people at my birth and I've always needed them all. They all have a job. So so little Eden was quite sick for two days and then, then he came completely good. So whatever was in his lungs dissipated over 48 hours and then he was able to come up to the room with me. They, they um, what's it called when you get put into hospital? Uh, admitted. Mm -hmm. They admitted me as well, which was, they didn't have to. 
that was actually very kind of them to let me stay there or else I would have had to go home and come back, which would have been so awful. So they admitted me and uh, we stayed together in the room. And he went on to be quite, both of the boys went on to have asthma issues. Eden went on to get bronchiolitis quite a few times in his early baby days. So they both had a weakness in their lungs. So little Eden, I mean, I had the birth of my dreams up until that point, up until the point of transfer. And, and the straight after birth was, it was unsettling. I was, it was distressing to watch him decline like that. Uh, but he was a totally peaceful, amazing baby. So just to go back to that fear you, with you, mm, having mm-hmm. that, you know, can you see, did you gauge some sort of correlation between that fear and then what eventuated? Was it some sort of deep instinctual thing or was it... Mm. There was something about, because, you know, home birthing is a pretty radical thing to do even. Um, I uh, am very different to everybody in my family and it was kind of a really weird thing to be doing and I think I had this kind of um, fear that something would go wrong and it would be all my fault because I had chosen to home birth. And... Um, I don't really see what I was able to see after it all. It gets a bit murky between what my fear was and what actually happened because I wasn't, I wasn't really thinking that he was going to die when he was turning blue and I actually felt that he was going to be okay. So once I let go of that fear, once I released it, it was gone. So it felt like a whole new story from after that. But um, I did have that thing of I'm so selfish, why would I want to do that? And my baby was so sick. So I think there are different stories, maybe not related, but in the end I think I was worried about being judged by my family for uh, putting my baby at risk. But my mum, who came to the birth, actually said, well, you got the birth you wanted and he got the care he needed. So it kind of still was the perfect birth for you both. Wow, that's such an awesome thing to say from your mama. I know. <laughs> because, and she, yeah, yeah, sorry, go. Well, she was the one that I would, was fearing the judgment from, really. Yeah, yeah, that's what, yeah, that's what I was just about to sort of highlight on because you had that fear coming mm-hmm. from your family and I can mm-hmm. truly relate to that too. Yeah. Um, to get yourself into the space as a mother too when you've just had this birth um, yeah. where you're completely thankful that there is hospitals and ambulances yeah. and, yeah. you know, that, that that was great. But if you go there and you don't have, like you said, you had to sort of do a bit of work because you're a home birth transfer and it happens mm-hmm. still to this day, yeah. that you can go there and be completely supported would look a lot different as if you went there and yeah. you were like... Oh, yeah. no, you know, you should have da-da-da-da-da. What I just see, it's so interesting to see that story. I see fear that's come up that's really relevant and valid and that mm-hmm. by expressing it and letting it out, you've allowed a shift in this situation of what happened. Pre- I mean, pregnancy does that. It, le- it allows these opportunities to release these things that need to be released. Just see so many gifts that come out of that experience just like your mum said you know he got the care that he needed it um it, it would have he would have got that same care if we birthed at hospital yes and he, he would have had the same issues it wasn't the birth that made him have those issues whatever it was a weakness in his lungs it would have happened wherever we were so we were very fortunate yeah. but it worked out how it did so the lessons from this birth? I... So I still, you know, I just saw myself as some kind of birthing warrior mama <laughs> being able to just birth these babies so easily. Um, and I had to still work within a system. I wasn't um, – so being able to walk into the system, work with the system – 
was a uh, learning and it also really evolved me as a doula because of course the births that I was called to after that were births where the baby got transferred to the NICU and the mothers needed lots of support and reassurance and so I I began to walk between those worlds the natural birthing world and the hospital NICU intervention world so he gifted me with a lot of uh, understanding, compassion, learning, uh, shape-shifting to be what I needed to be in, in different situations. So uh, the births, both of the births led me deeper into the world of support in the birthing world. Mm, that's right. Yeah, very interesting. And so you started doulering. When did you start working as a doula? I started straight away, so I was pregnant with Eden when I did my trainee births. Um, so you do three trainee births um, before you are fully qualified, and and so after Eden was born, I was doing. I started doing paid doula work, and uh, oh, I also did um, birth hypnosis. Learned that, so I was teaching that um, to the women lightly. Whoever wanted it, I offered it as a extra service uh and but i wasn't attending heaps you know i was still i was a ballet teacher so i a dance teacher so i was still doing that three nights a week um three afternoons a week after eden was born as well so it was very part-time doula in mm. and just to lightly touch on it what was your first experience like being a doula and witnessing birth uh I was pretty frightened. <laughs> I just I just had a feeling of I've actually got no right to be here. That what what um what do I know? How can I be of service here? This woman was um doing hypnobirthing and was just so quiet and in her zone and I mean they're the, the best kind of doula jobs where you're not really needed, but on my very first all job, I kind of felt like a bit of an accessory. But she needed help towards the end, and I knew why I was there at the end. But I remember a very awkward feeling at the start going, oh, what am I doing here? This is I'm not needed, which is a common thing that comes up for me. What is my purpose? I need to know what my purpose is in this place right now. But it takes time. It takes um, – jewelry brings a lot of waiting around a lot of the time so I was uncomfortable with that at the start I felt like I needed a job to do and something to a purpose but the purpose was to just be present and uh, I got into it by the end of it. Um, that's really awesome to share with other doulas or aspiring mm -hmm. doulas because I felt pretty much the exact same thing. Oh really? <laughs> that art of um, being, you know, present without a presence sort of thing. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I struggled with that too because I felt like, oh, I'm not doing anything and I should be mm -hmm. this and that. And, and it brought up mm -hmm. a lot of anxiety during the process. So mm. it's it's probably normal. So it's okay to work through that because it's a big transformation. I think totally. I all of experiencing her first birth. <laughs> and I've had a friend that's been at all of my births and every time she's walked in, She's like, oh, ready, on guard. And by the fourth birth, I was just like, honey, sit down. It's going to take a while. Yeah. Relax. <laughs> so after Eden, um, yeah. how long after did you become pregnant again? Well, uh, with each of the babies, I uh, as soon as I stopped breastfeeding, which was about 18 months, I had a couple of months off and got my cycle back and then got pregnant again. So... Another two years and two months later, I got pregnant for the third time. And uh, I was, where was I? I was doulaing a lot. I think I knew a lot more people in the home birth community. I started going to the home birth conference um, and just really still knew that that is what I wanted to do. Uh, I was working at the Australian Doula College as a office helper and a, a doula trainer, and I I knew that's the kind what I really wanted to do. But I, with my past two previous experiences of transfer to the NICU, 
I felt like, you know, the right thing to do would be to go to hospital just in case. So I booked in to the birth centre at Randwick again and the first thing they said was, it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally the birth centre is closed. And I was like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> we're not doing this again. And so I I went home and called the at that time, I think it's not happening anymore, you might know Ali, but um, the St. George Hospital had a home birth program. And I wasn't quite in the border, but I was on the edge, on the outside edge of the border. And because I'd had uh, to, because I'd had a home birth before, they accepted me into the hospital home birth program. So for me, that felt like a good compromise. They know my history. They're saying, yes, I can have a home birth. And um, so what I did differently this time is that I didn't tell anybody that I was having a home birth, including my mother, my family or anybody, because I just, I felt fully able to take the full responsibility on, of it on, my, on myself and my decision and my husband's decision to have a home birth. And uh, I didn't want anybody else's fears or worries interfering with that was your husband supportive at the yeah time? Yep. yep yep he was he was yeah <laughs> uh, he pretty much goes with what I say <laughs> so if he, he thought if you if you're confident to do it great and he was also comforted by the fact that it was through a hospital and if we did have to transfer they knew they knew who we were we weren't rocking up like last time rocking up out of the blue with it with a blue baby um, from a home birth, they would know who we were and um, we would be uh, supported by the, the same midwives at home that we would have been at the hospital. So that helped. Um, and this little baby, were, I, I really wanted to know if it was a boy or a girl because I thought it was going to be a boy and I just wanted to prepare myself for that. Being a ballet dancer, I had always imagined myself having daughter to take to ballet <laughs> so I went Cameron didn't want to know my husband didn't want to know so I went and had ultrasound by myself and she said it's a girl and I just burst into tears on the the ultrasound chair and my whole life flashed in front of my eyes and I just felt the red thread behind me and ahead of me and um it felt very powerful. And so, and I also remember the pain of growing up a girl. And I just said, right then, she, I, I hope she's strong. And, um, or I said, she has to be strong. And so I, that was all a great pregnancy up until 37 weeks when they discovered that uh, she was breech which is quite late to discover a breach. Um, but so she was breached. It was quite stressful. But it happened that the St. George Hospital was running a trial on uh, external cephalic version with breach and its success and things like that. So I was able to get put into the trial and have a version done there. And I had tried acupuncture and lying upside down on a tilted ironing board and yoga and moxibustion and everything, having speakers down my underpants so that the baby goes down to listen to the music. I tried everything. I haven't heard Red, that one before. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> Read uh, Maggie Banks, who I'm excited to see at the Home Birth Conference this year. Um, and... I nothing nothing was shifting nothing at all and I the um the midwives had said you can't have a home birth with a breech birth with this program and so I just thought I would try and have a little call around and see if there was any home birth midwives that would um support me at home with breech and I didn't find any, but with my emailing and messaging, I came across uh, Jane Hardwick Collins, who we both know well, and 
she, uh, I just had my mother blessing ceremony with all my friends and it was beautiful. And, but I was also crying because my baby was breached and I didn't know what this birth was going to be like. And Jane called me up after everyone had gone and said, I said, can you be my midwife? And she said, no, I can't do a breech birth at home. But she talked to me about what this breech baby was trying to tell me. And she shamanic, shamanically midwifed me over the phone and um, helped me connect with the baby and ask what, what the baby wanted me to do. And it was my first experience of shamanic midwif- midwifery. So the baby said, go have the version, see what happens, and then if that doesn't work, then take the next step to finding a, a home midwife, home birth midwife who would help me with a breech birth at home. So I went for the version, um, which was successful. It was full on. It was painful. It was the drug they give you, I had heart palpitations for two days after, rushing anxiety, but the baby stayed and she turned um, and I was able to still have a home birth with the St. George Home Birth Hospital program. And that birth was, you know, so we had two, two toddlers, a two and a four-year-old and we're in this tiny little house and um, I thought it was happening Uh, again 42 weeks and I was right on the cutoff point to still being able to have the baby at home um, with the program at 42 weeks and I went into labor that night so and the labor was in total one hour long so it was pretty full on um can you for that hour so what was how did it start? Did it start really quickly or? Well, we had dinner and then I was washing up and I felt a little bit of a, a pain, but nothing much. And then I called the midwives, midwives and um, I was watching the tennis, which is so weird because I never watch any sport on TV. I can't stand it. So I should have known then that I was fully in an altered state of consciousness uh, but um, Cameron was again asleep on the lounge and I said, call the midwife, baby's coming. He set up the pool really fast. I don't know how he did it. Um, and this baby, she um, was pushing her feet up into my ribs and her body was fully stretched out. You know how babies usually come out curled up in a little ball? She came out straight, like dark, pushed off her feet and dived out and so I couldn't um I had to lie flat I was stretched out on my side flat I couldn't bend over or roll over or anything and the midwife had to catch her because she was just kicking herself out <laughs> is that like the, the true style of a ballet dancer perhaps is that <laughs> strong kind of legs yeah. she just did a big um grand grand allegro out of the womb <laughs> Uh, and she came out strong and healthy and breathing and not even a hint of any kind of breathing issues and I was really like check her breathing check her heart I kept asking them to check but she was just healthy and perfect and beautiful straight away Mm. and did you have those feelings as soon as she came out to check everything yeah 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 and then did you relax and let all the hormones yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I did. Um, but, you know, it's quite a shock, but, yeah, I was really – because it was so fast. But, yeah, so the first midwife didn't make it, but the second midwife got there first. So there was a midwife that got there. But, yeah, so, so fast, and that's so her. And her name is Nina, which in Native American means strong. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, she's a strong little one. But she's 10 now, is she? She's nine and a, nine and a half. Nine and a half, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, she is really strong. And she was, from the moment she was born, uh, she had all four of us running around. Everyone was like, the baby's crying, quick. And we would all do whatever it took to make her happy again. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And is she, in, does she like ballet? Is she, she does, does do she ballet, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. I went a bit early a bit. I went a bit hard too soon and put her into ballet when she was one year old. 
Um, and she didn't like it after a couple of years. And I thought, oh, no, I've blown my chance, but she's back at it now. She yeah. What about the boys? Do they like ballet? I, they... I tried to get them into it, but they're both – they're really sporty, physical, agile guys. Um, they're both – in, they're both great dancers, but they don't think it's cool. So, yeah, yeah, I didn't succeed. With them. It must be hard in the ballet world to like promote boys to want to dance ballet. Yeah, the whole stigma uh, around it. Well, I think they're very accepted and loved in the ballet world. It's just yeah. out in the real world, it's completely not acceptable. <laughs> I know, but Still. like I, I think now, like as you know. A, I think of a male in his young 20s, right? Like if I was back mm. in my 20s and mm-hmm. met a ballet dancer, they'd be so fit and agile. They are so fit, and strong. Just... Yeah, I tried, I tried. Yeah. Didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then after Nina's birth, I went and trained with Jane Hardwick Collings at uh-huh, right. what was then the School of Shamanic Midwifery, which is now the School of Shamanic Womancraft. Mm. And so did you just go to back on Nina's birth? Did mm-hmm. What did that sort of teach you? Um, it taught me that I was right. <laughs> <laughs> to trust, trust the... To interest, trust. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was, I was right to trust birth and to trust myself and, yeah. Yay. I mean, Yay. That's such, yeah, that's, that's huge. And I'm wondering too if there's a little p- compartment there that is trusting there was a strong instinct because if you did decide to go to Ranwick at the birth mm-hmm. centre and it was shut and you mm-hmm. obviously birthed in an hour, that would have been traumatic in itself. I'm yeah. just wondering if there was a big strong instinct to want to stay at home just because you needed to be supported there to have the birth. Yeah, um, I think I wouldn't have made it. I wouldn't have made it to yeah. hospital. And you would have yeah. had one of those like crazy car births and you know, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And yeah, it's hard. That's tough for some people. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, I think instinctually there, maybe there was something that was like, this is where I need to be at home because I have fast births. And yeah. 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 I was right. Yes. <laughs> You're listening to the Circle of Birth podcast, circleofbirth.com. All right, so tell me about the work with Jane and how that so, shape shifted you into the next birth. So I started, Nina was uh, one and a half when I started my training with Jane and the what I did was the first ever Four Seasons journey, but it wasn't called that then. It was called SSM1 um, and so it was a year-long course and we had no idea what we were turning up to. It was the first time it had ever been run. But I had such a strong need to be there that I went along and I didn't um, – I was it was like turning up to a birth. <laughs> I was really frightened when I got there. and But it also felt like coming home and I was exactly in the right place at the right time. And – uh, met some incredible women who are still we're still a strong circle out there now supporting each other through life's big stuff and uh, so I learned how to midwife myself and uh, learn about myself figure out who I am and why I'm here on this earth and what I'm going to do with this life and learned how to be a shamanic midwife or shamanic woman crafter for other women. But first you have to do the work on yourself. First you have to midwife yourself, your own soul journey, and then you can midwife others. And this, and is, like, this is what essentially the program is about, the yes. core and what you teach, the eight seasons journey. Um, yes. Yeah, so what the course I did is now called the four seasons journey and, uh, I teach a eight seasons journey, which is the same program, but over two years. So more spread out, um, time frame. And so, yeah, so that's the work of it to figure out who you are, what's your agenda, where have you been, where are you going to, and how you can best serve others. 
And just for all the listeners, I'll put all the links in the show notes for this work too. Thanks, Ali. <laughs> uh, and during my year, my one year, so um, we do all sorts of amazing things, but it is camping on the land, and which I had never done by myself before. I'd always gone with my husband camping, and he kind of took care of that, and I just rocked up. So it was a lot of learning how to be self-sufficient and take care of myself out there. And, uh, and we also do a vision quest, which is going out on a solo for three days and three nights into the bush. And um, by solo, I mean completely alone, uh, in solitude, just with yourself and everything you need for three days and three nights. And at that time when I did that, I was eight months pregnant with my fourth baby. So I fell pregnant soon after I began the Four Seasons journey and did that journey with her in my tummy. So did you so just did you know um, as you went along in your pregnancies that were these babies just coming to you or you're like, mm-hmm. all right, I wanna like no. you know, so they came to you and you were like okay, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. All right, you can come. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no, she was she wasn't planned. I mean the second and third ones we were open to, uh, but we kind of thought we would stop at three. So it was it was a it was a big surrender to say yes to a fourth because it wasn't really in the plan, but um it was an incredible experience to be doing this work and especially to do my solo out in the bush pregnant, so pregnant, in, uh, we were in the Kangaroo Valley. And on the vision quest, the, it comes from a Native American tradition where the men traditionally would go out uh, by themselves for three days and three nights fasting and uh, sometimes taking hallucinogens, uh, but to receive a vision. And so that's what we do on our vision quest. We live in a different world now where um, the women traditionally didn't do vision quests because they have their moon time each month where they retreat into their red tent or their moon lodge and have their three days and three nights and emerge with the visions of their blood time. But we don't have that luxury in our modern world or that honoring in our modern world. So that's why we do this vision quest. So for me, it was the first time in my whole life I'd been by myself physically for longer than about 12 hours. So it felt very luxurious as a mother of three to have three days and nights by myself. Also confronting uh, and I had a lot of time to talk with my baby. Um, She also was breached at that time and um, I didn't know it at the time when I got back from my vision quest I found out she was breached but um, in my my vision was seeing her perfect birth so I knew that it was all going to be okay Um, and so yes I was having a home birth again with her. I decided to go with independent midwives this time because I didn't want to do all of the testing with this baby that I had to, I had to do quite a lot of testing to be in the St. George home birth program, Uh, ultrasounds and glucose. um, What is it? GBS. Um, And I didn't really want to do that this time. So I went with an independent midwife who was open to me not doing all of that testing and um, found out she was breech and decided to approach it in a completely different way, which was uh, talking to her. And um, what she taught me through her breechness was uh, there's a beautiful thing that's said about breech babies, which Jane said to me, is that breech babies have their head up near your heart um, to comfort you and look after you. And so what ha- happened throughout the pregnancy was that whenever I would feel like overwhelmed with 
all this mothering I was doing and um, the strong little Mina who was born was a very strong little two-year-old who uh, took a really so much of my energy. My little baby inside was teaching me to take the path of least resistance with her. Uh, I would connect with her and she would just say, just give everything love, give it all love. When, it, when I felt like, you know, freaking out and sending people to their rooms, the baby would tell me to pour more love into it, draw the babies closer to you and let go. So I had um, about uh, five weeks of that kind of reminders and um, and also I my home birth midwife wasn't up for a breech birth at home either so I called around to see if there were any others because I felt I felt pretty sure that I could do it um, and I so I found some angel midwives who agreed to support me if she wanted to come breach and um, so I said to the baby, okay, if you want to come breach, that's fine. We're ready for you now. And um, I went to have an ultrasound to see if she turned. And she turned. So as soon as I got the yes from that she could come any which way she wanted, she turned and I was able to birth with my original midwife at home. Just how long do you think in her turning to when you sort of processed all of this, do you think it was like within a day or so? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm, yeah, I think it was within a few days of getting a yes from those two midwives because I, I remember texting them a few days after saying, guess what, she's turned, thank you for your support. It meant everything, and I think it's part of the reason why she turned, is that I said she could come any way she wanted, and I felt fully supported to birth however I wanted to and however my baby needed to. Yeah, I mean, this is just essentially it, isn't it, for motherhood, yeah. to really connect with that support, because, I, I mean, this is so important. This is what it's all about, yeah. is support, and you've essentially, like, I think that's beautiful what Jane said, that she's got mm -hmm. her head close to your heart um, mm -hmm. supporting you. And then you by you just going, I'm ready now. I've got that yeah. support there. Um, yeah. It's just, it, it's so possible. And I just truly believe that in your story. Like it's just yeah. blowing my mind. It's amazing. And it's just, that's it. It's essentially support. And when you know that you're supported to go within, to be allowed to spiritually connect and shamanically connect with your baby... Mm -hmm. giving yourself that space it's like oh, oh. yeah <laughs> well you. it was it was everything and it informs my mothering to this day like choosing the path of love taking the path of least resistance is still my motto for mothering yeah yeah definitely it's not always it doesn't always feel easy to do that but it generally even though it takes longer <laughs> it's the easiest path mm. uh, so ultrasound turns. yeah um, so way. ultrasound, she turned. I remember being at Fox Studios with the other three little kitties jumping on a jumping castle and messaging the other midwife saying, yay, she's turned. And um, again, my midwife had a cutoff for 42 weeks that she was – so I've had that cutoff throughout all four births <laughs> that you have to have the baby by 42 weeks. So um, I just was like – beside myself thinking this baby was never going to come because, you know, even though every other baby had been 42 weeks, you still think, surely this baby will come before that. I still had it in my mind. I don't know why. If I was to have another baby now, I would expect it to come at 42 weeks, but I just thought this one would come earlier, and she didn't. And so I, I couldn't do the school drop-off one more time with everyone looking at me going, oh, my gosh, I haven't had that baby yet. And so I got my mum to come with me and I drove, but she walked the kids in and as we were driving, I felt my first contraction. And um, so I called the midwife and said it started and um, it was just really different to any of the other labours, really um, like a contraction an hour and then a contraction every 20 minutes and then 
nothing. And then, so the midwife came and checked and all was fine, but she said, I'll probably see you later tonight. And then nothing happened that night. I mean, I was up all night with bits and pieces, but um, just was really kind of pre laborish stuff. I trusted that it was all doing something because that had been my experience with long pre-labors. Um, so, but I was getting really tired staying up and it turned out to be three days of that. And, um, on the last day I got my mum just to take the kids out all day. They went and did stuff. I, uh, still was contracting really irregularly, but it was, it was happening and I had to walk. I was walking, walking, walking. We had the t- a tiny little house and I was walking into every corner of every room around and around and around. I, I trod, um, you know, marks into the floor with my walking and walking. And it was a really kind of different contraction feeling, very sharp each time. And um, so this was at about, you know, five, six in the afternoon. It's her birthday next Tuesday, so the 8th of August. Um, so it was winter, freezing cold, wandering around the house for hours. And then they didn't really say anything, but the midwives knew that the baby was posterior. I didn't know. I didn't know. And it didn't, in my state, it didn't really cross my mind um, that that's what I was dealing with. But it, it was a classic posterior labor. And then... In, I got in the pool thinking it's still ages away because my contractions were still five minutes apart. Um, and then it all it all just started happening. I can't, this bit's a little bit blurry, but um, I birthed her into my hands. It was really painful. The pushing out was very sharp and intense. And um, she came out looking at me and then I, it all clicked and I went, oh my gosh, that's what a posterior labor is. Okay. And she came out a little squashed. Her head was a bit misshapen and her nose was kind of pushed sideways, but uh, beautiful, breathing, happy, all good with her siblings all around her, her grandma there, her godmother, doula, two midwives, daddy and me. Very full room again. How did you feel after that? What was it? That, uh, that birth, I didn't get the euphoric high that I had got the last three births after I gave birth. So I think I was really exhausted. Um, but I just, the pieces of it were all falling into place. You know, like she wasn't ready to come right on 42 weeks, but she, we went into labor so it would be okay for her to carry on for a few more days being in utero doing what she needed to do um and i cho- we chose the name her name's willow and we chose that because after our experience of nina being so strong <laughs> we were like yeah you've got to be strong but also flexibility is really good so we chose willow which is strong and flexible and um i felt that that's how she how her labor her pregnancy you know being breach and being really strong in that position but then when given what she wanted to you know birth the way she wanted she turned and she helped and saying you know she went into labor we went into labor just in time but then she went on to have the three days of the labor that she needed to come out on the day that she wanted to be born um so I felt a lot of trust in her journey and because she'd been my guide and letting me know how to handle being a mother of four young children I totally trusted the path that she chose for herself so again um strong trusting um it was very joyous and as soon as she was born she she balanced our family we felt we knew that we were complete as a family she brought incredible um peace and balance did you feel that? Because um, I talked to a mother a uh, while ago about that feeling and she said when she birthed her fourth, 
Mm-hmm. She knew straight away. She went, everyone's here and they're safe. And yeah. she said the same thing. She didn't get that like intense sort of, you know, high and rush. It was uh-huh. just more of a like, okay, like. We're all here now. Is that similar maybe? Did you, did you feel yeah. Like, did it come straight away to you or did it? Yeah, I I knew that that was our family then and because it was so big to say yes to her coming because I was like, whoa, four kids is a lot of kids. Um, uh, I just, when she came, we just all knew this, this was our little family, perfectly balanced. I mean, we were three, three women and three men and we just felt it all fall into place. So, yeah, I felt complete as a mother as to these were my children. Wow. Mm. Thank you. Can we head into your next births? Um, okay. Of the teaching, the eight seasons journey, and also making sacred, which I'd love mm-hmm. to talk about, and the dancing. And mm-hmm. um, can you just sort of intertwine us a little bit into there before we wrap up the podcast? Okay. Uh, so with the dancing, I've been dancing my whole life since I was seven years old. And as I said before, I was a ballet dancer and teaching throughout my early pregnancy and child raising days. Uh, and I think the start of the, I have a Instagram called making sacred where I do dances almost every day. And sometimes my kids dance with me and, uh, it's a really big, part of my life is dancing um but I but even before recording I I dance every day whenever something's going on I turn on the music and we have a big dance or just I dance or um it's it's something that I, it has been my practice every day for most of my life so um and the videoing started when I took a video when I was pregnant dancing with my first baby and with my fourth baby uh and then I just started recording them occasionally, and now it's a it's a daily thing. Um, it's and great to watch everyone, by the way, too. And I'll put the links okay. in the show notes for that. But it's just gorgeous, and when your family comes in, and then your beautiful outfits, it's just <laughs> such a delight. And it's very inspiring. Like I, I always, you know, it's one of those things that I love to do in the morning, and mm-hmm. I, f- I feel like I draw inspiration from you because it's like. Yeah, I love moving my body like that in the morning. And then with the children around, that resonates onto them and, yeah. Yeah, so, and they yeah. love it too. And it's a, it's where I play with my kids. That's our play. Um, so, and so with the School of Shamanic Womancraft, as it's called now, um, I continued on after my first year of training with Jane to become a teacher for the school. And because I was the first, because we did the first year, I, the apprenticeship just kind of grew as I did it. We n- didn't know how long it was going to be or what was going to happen. I just kept doing it each year again and again and again until I felt, okay, I can teach this now. I'm good. So it ended up being a three-year apprenticeship and a one-year internship with Jane teaching alongside. And, and then I went on to developed the ASJ program and I'm now into my second cycle of teaching that with the Divine Ali as one of the mermaid sisters. Mm -hmm. Um, That's me. That's you. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And we are called mermaids because we're a school. Did Jane talk about this when you spoke to her? A little bit, but yeah, just talk about it again so we're a school but we're not like a school with a headmaster and teachers and students there's not a hierarchy it's more like a school of fish where we swim one way and we follow one swished fish we swim the other way we follow the other we swim up we swim down and so every every fish in the circle is the teacher and the student and so we're learning from each other and so she wondered what kind of fish we would be and decided that we were definitely mermaids So that's where we got that little um, name that we love to call each other. Um, And what else do we need to say about that, Ali? Well, mainly how does it feel now that you're teaching this um, important work um, Mm -hmm. for women and for men too because we've got a figure Mm -hmm. that's supporting the, you know, the wounded masculine as well as Mm -hmm. the feminine. So Mm -hmm. we're not a bunch of feminists that are like, you know, they, men hijacked us and blah, blah, blah. We're actually trying to pull in resources from our 
um, mm-hmm. history is in womanhood um, to help heal. Oh, it's a humanitarian thing. It's for women mm-hmm. and men. And um, how does it feel teaching such a powerful um, and important work? Um, do you ever take a moment and just sit back with your group, like say our group, um, yeah. and just go, wow, like. <laughs> Yeah, every time, every time. And, you know, it was scary to be the first teacher apart from Jane to teach it because I wondered, you know, is is Jane the magic ingredient that makes this all happen? But it's actually the work and the circle coming together that makes the magic happen. So uh, I learn so much from all of the women that come and every group is so different, but magically the results are kind of the same what we end up with is is healing in process healing whole women who know who they are and what they are here to do so uh, it is incredible to witness it in motion as I am with your group right now we're almost halfway getting to our halfway point we are yeah (laughs) and feeling feeling the magic happening again so lots of evidence that it works. So yeah, I do stand back and go, wow. And also I'm, I'm very grateful to be part of each circle Mm. because the the magic ingredient is us all showing up, committing and showing up to doing the work. Yeah. um, (laughs) Making sacred. So making sacred. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the birth of that. (laughs) So it started out as a little blog to, I put some of my ideas out there about birthing and shamanic woman craft and it's it's grown now. Um, I I run circles in person. I teach Moon Circle, which is a Wisdom of the Cycles uh, workshop for women, and then I do one for mothers and daughters. So it's a welcome uh, preparation for men up first period circle, and um, I also do private shamanic woman craft sessions for women one on one through Skype or in person and. I have what the circle is being called further afield. So women overseas want to learn how to do this and I I can't be everywhere and nor can Jane or anyone. So I've developed some online uh, programs. One is Moon Circle, which is the Wisdom of the Cycles course, which once women complete, they can actually go and teach it themselves as well. And I have done Blessing the Mother, which is a guide to running mother blessing ceremonies for pregnant women uh, or for yourself if you wanted to hold a space for yourself. And I have just completed Blessing the Maiden, which is a guide for holding a ceremony for your daughter who has just had her first period. So there is a ceremony for a group. If you have a group of girls, like if I teach a mother and maiden circle to a group of school friends, then we can gather again in, you know, two years or whatever, when they've all come to their blood and do an honoring ceremony for each of them. Uh, Or there's a ceremony for a mother and daughter. And also some girls just, no matter how hard you try, are really not into ceremonies. And so I have designed a little gift box that you can make for them and some girls like my friend Michaela's daughter just want to go to Maya and buy something nice so that has to be okay as well but what's important is that they are recognized at this rite of passage so I'm offering ways to do that and I also have just finished a six week guide to how to run a women's circle So that's called Calling the Circle, and that is going to be out when I get my act together. Wow, I didn't know that. (laughs) Yeah, I've been busy. I've been busy in the winter. (laughs) Um, So the Blessing the Maiden Guide's out, is it? You've got that. Well, I've finished. I'm just, um, it's just getting pulled together in a beautiful package to send out. So I'll let you all know when that's out. Yeah, so just to everyone, the Blessing Way um, guide is amazing. And it, again, it's like you don't have to have all the stuff or all this, you know, training or anything. You, if you want to run it for your friend because you think it's really important, then your guide's really good to do that. And the same with the maiden. It doesn't have to be this elusive thing. It can be... Exactly. You, know, you don't like, need to yeah. have the incredible community around you to create, to be like, oh, well, no one's into that around here. You have to make it yourself. So... What, call in the call in your own circle by making it happen for your daughter and for yourself and mm. that's what I had to do I didn't have it in my community so I called it in yeah 
yeah, we could do a whole other podcast on maidens and coming into yeah. the heart, couldn't we? Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. So another thing that gets me going in life. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, Tula, I'm so honoured and I just feel, like I actually feel right now like that feeling of life affirming that just by hearing mm-hmm. your journeys and being able to go through that journey with you by you recounting your stories, what I say on this podcast is story medicine and I actually feel mm-hmm. very healed in so many parts of my body. All the correlations and connections and synchronicities in your journeys and to what you're doing now and I'm really glad that I'm even doing this eight seasons journey with you and Mm. everything so (laughs) me too Ali thank you so much my pleasure thank you so much it's been really it's been a um I feel like I've had a therapy session thanks Ali (laughs) you can um, (laughs) get off off the couch now (laughs) did this episode tickle your heart move and rattle you in its wisdom I hope you resonated with the show Please head over to the website, circleofbirth.com, for show notes, including my personalised take on the episode, pictures, resources, and how you can connect with a storyteller. Sign up to the newsletter, and most importantly, please help this show grow to its full potential of serving you in its ancient wisdom. Donations made easy via PayPal. All donations will be received with love. Head to circleofbirth.com slash donate. And yes, I'd love an iTunes rating. This has been another episode of the Birth Share Project. We breathe, we birth, we become. We are